testing. Happy Sabbath, church. How are you doing? Oh, trying to stay cool, right? Thank you for the wonderful music, the scripture reading. Today I'm going to talk about neighbors, right? Who's my neighbor? It is very interesting, this word neighbor, right? You know that I lived in a bunch of places, speak a couple of languages, so I'm very curious where words come from. Right, and, and when we read the scripture in Spanish, it talks about mi prójimo, right? Prójimo, it's, it doesn't say mi vecino, right? That's when we think of my neighbor. It's, you know, prójimo. What word in English could, could you think that comes in? Prójimo. Proximity, right? This Bible verse is talking about who we are in proximity. But before we kept going, let's ask for the Holy Spirit to be right next to us in proximity. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessing, the opportunity to be here today here at church. May we get to study your word and go closer to you, be in proximity to you and to each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we live in a very diverse country, in a very diverse world, right? We, most of us would consider ourselves Adventists, right? But now there's all this non-denominational Christians, spiritual individuals, religious persons, right? So it gets a little blurry when, when we start defining ourselves. But, uh, here we go. So I went into the Barna uh, website. I have a subscription to it. Let me see. Maybe not. Maybe this one. There we go. So in 2017, oh, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing it the other way. Right? If we ask, like, what are the characteristics or values or traits that self described Christians would say, you know, this is very important uh, to me as a Christian, right? We see authenticity, leadership, obedience, solidarity, sincerity, fidelity, communication, truthfulness, respectfulness, decency, being prudent, being empathetic, compassion, loyalty, self-discipline, love, friendship, patriotism, tolerance. Two years ago, right? They researched and asked about 1,007 people uh, via phone and online, you know, if you could use one word, and these are the types of words, right? And the frequency comes up there, like I would show all those stats. But all these different words, right? And this is why I, I chose Galatians, right? What does it mean to be a Christian, right? What is the one value if we were able to identify ourselves? It's love, right? So that is the one value. We, we, we see people, when they think about Christianity, when they think about their faith, their spirituality, their religiosity, they have all these different words. But we need to get back to love, right? That is the essential component. So when we're next to somebody else, we see in Leviticus, do not seek revenge or bear or grudge against fellow Israelites, neighbor in different ver versions, but love your neighbor, ask yourself, I am the Lord. So whoever's next to us, whoever... Uh, sits next to us, whoever lives next to us, those of us who travel, right? Sometimes when you're not traveling with your family, you're like, uh oh, who's got that middle seat? Or if you're in the middle seat, who's got the out? <laughs> who's going to be in proximity to you for about an hour and a half, two hours, maybe five, right? How are you supposed to treat that person? In the New Testament, we go to Luke 10, 27 and says, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, all of your mind. And then you should love your neighbor as yourself. So the Bible tells us that those people who are next to us need to receive the love just like we would treat ourselves, right? We kind of teach our kids that golden rule, right? Treat others like you would like to be treated. Very important concept. We start teaching it very early. But then it gets a little complicated, right? 
why does it get complicated, right? Here we go, Mark. They keep talking about it. And I know that it's important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. We start having disagreements at certain points. We meet people who are quite different from us and sometimes that difference makes us uncomfortable. When we don't like something, uh, I'm working with my kids. Ketsia, here's a story about you. You can cover your ears if you don't want to listen. I present her with a new fruit she's never tried before. Her reaction to a new fruit is of like, oh, disgust, uncomfortableness. Things that are unfamiliar, right, tend to generate in ourselves a little bit of uncomfortableness, right? That's for safety reasons, right? We look into a new place, we start observing. But then comes those differences. When we disagree or don't like something, it is difficult to, for us to show that love. Differences. Disagreements, right? These are things that get in the way as we start to get older. How many know all your neighbors, right? I don't. You, well, we have some people here on campus like, yeah, they've been here all the time. Now, is it easy to like all the things that your neighbors do, right? I see some shaking their head, right? It's not easy, but what's more important, right? This is where our scripture says, it is more important to love our neighbors. And this is not blasphemy, me, okay, here, than to be vegetarian, right? Right? <laughs> it is more important to show our love than, you know, if somebody out there is eating pork or shrimp, not just beef, right? She's not following that kosher diet. It is more important to love that person than to keep the Sabbath. I know, I know, and see, there's no lightning or thunder hitting me, right? The law can get in the way of how we love our neighbors. What we grew up learning and understanding and really getting to know how important it is for our salvation, for ourselves, can get in the way of loving our neighbors. This is why Jesus' very key emphasis, right? We see it in all these different um, gospel writings where they're discussing this. It's a callback to Deuteronomy 6.4, right? It's like, love your... Lord, with all you might, follow the commandments and do this every day and every night. And there were some people in Israel at the time that were really good at following this all day and all night. But it got in the way of loving their neighbors. The enemy next door. So it's one thing that I may not like the music that my neighbor does uses, the food or the spices that my neighbor has. It's another thing with my neighbor. I live in apartments. And when my neighbor parks their car in that covered parking slot in the summer, oh, oh, I just, once it was just my, uh, it was somebody moving in. They actually didn't know their number, right? It's so like, okay, we can, we can make this work. But I have this reaction, right? And it's just a parking spot, right? Some of us, maybe within our own family, maybe in our workplace, maybe in the classroom, we've experienced a situation or an interaction where that neighbor, that person that we are next to, who we are in proximity to, 
has said something negative about ourselves, criticizes our work, disagrees with us, and they suddenly turn to an enemy. Right? First, we work like, okay, they do, it's, a, it's that coworker who's always playing music and it's hard for me to concentrate. That's something, right? We can kind of work towards accepting that difference. Maybe we bring our own headphones. But if that person who we are next to does something, says something against us, right? It gets a little harder, but those Bible verses didn't say, treat your friends like you want to be treated. It doesn't say, treat those who are similar to you like the way you want to be treated. It doesn't say, treat those who are Adventist like you want to be treated. Treat those next to you like you want to be treated. It's, there's no qualifier in there, right? It's whoever we are next to that they require our love. That's the biblical instruction. Whoever we are next to, that's the person. So Peter, you know, kind of likes to talk a lot in the New Testament. He's like, okay, okay. I think I'm getting this. I think I'm getting this. So in Luke 17, 4, he goes, so even if that person wrongs you seven times a day, each time turn again and ask forgiveness, you must forgive. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Forgiveness. When somebody next door says, does something against you, that it hurts, it angers you, you need to forgive. So let's, let's make a pause right here. When I use the word forgiveness, can I, can I have some volunteers give me what they think that means? What, what is forgiveness? What's forgiveness? Clean slate. Mercy, okay, letting go. So clean slate, letting go, does that mean to forget that it happened? Mercy, does that mean we show them that they can do this again to us because we show mercy? If you forgive those who sins against you, your heavenly father, will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, it's a little small. Your father will not forgive your sins. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. This is a little bit controversial sometimes in the seminary. Uh, actually, Mark eleven twenty five 25, the New Living uh, Translation, which is the one that I use, doesn't include it, but in a lot of other translations, there's that verse 26, which, again, similar to Matthew 15, it says, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. So forgiveness, letting go, clean slate, mercy. Those are kind of the words that I heard some of you say that meant forgiveness. Our sins are things we have done towards Jesus, right? God experiences pain, doesn't like it. He suffers when we are involved in sin, right? Yet he came down despite our inability to earn that forgiveness and redeem us, right? We obtain redemption through his sacrifice. If your coworker, your classmate, your neighbor doesn't ask for forgiveness, what are we to do? If the person doesn't come and ask for forgiveness, should we forgive or not? 
I see some heads nodding. I see some eyes doing like this, like, hmm. Hmm. What should we do? Is the person who has hurt us, should we give forgiveness to that person if they don't ask for it? I need a little more emphatic answers, or you can say, like, I don't know. I can take an I don't know as well. I see some yeses. I heard that. Okay. What happens in our experience if we are unable to forgive? Right? Here in that verse, we, we see the word grudge. How many times in our lives have we gone through a painful, difficult experience, and we said, you know what, I'm going to forgive this person. We actually say those words. I'm going to forgive that person. And then a week later, a month later, we're talking to our friends, to our significant other, and we start telling them about that incident at work, at school, at the neighborhood community center, wherever we're at. And we start telling them that incident again. You know, Valeria, like, you should have seen like three days ago, I came here and there was this car parked in my spot, right? And as I am telling that story, as I'm remembering that event, what is filling my heart? Some anger. Is that forgiveness? Forgiveness is just not the words, I forgive you. Most of us who grew up in the church, went to schools, had that education of politeness, respecting one another. We understand that we need to forgive each other. We tell other kids, you hit her, go out, say sorry. And they go and they say, I'm sorry. Yes, the words are there. But what's the emotional element that we are missing in forgiveness? We actually need to love that person. Yes, we need to love that person who hurt us, who said something negative about us, who angered us because we need to shift our emotional response to that person. In my work in psychotherapy, I have to deal with this concept a lot of times, right? From people getting hurt in their relationships, right? Um, People with anger management issues, um, some issues of growing up, right, that they resent a significant person, a father, another family member in their life, right? And if they're not from a Christian background or have a sense of spirituality on that concept, I have to work with what in secular terms we call acceptance, right? It's a very utilized concept in in my field. And we go, so like, so you don't have to like it. You don't have to approve of that difficult situation that you had but you have to accept that it happened, right? We create that difference. We don't approve of, you know, you being hit, being neglected, whatever the situation is, but we need to work on accepting the fact that it happened before we can move on, before we can let go. And it's difficult. I mean, there's times where we're talking about this for months and it's very difficult. The person might be able to, like you say, okay, I need to forgive or I need to accept. But every time I think about this situation, my emotional reaction is anxiety, disgust, anger, fear, right? They're struggling with the emotion that this memory brings. We get to a point, right, where we really facilitate that ability to let go of the emotion. We don't let go of the memory. We don't forget, right? but we eventually get to the place that emotionally they can let go. But this is the wonderful gift that we have 
as children of God. Because our concept of forgiveness goes beyond that of acceptance. Matthew 18, 22, the unforgiven debtor. So what happens in this story, right? It's Jesus talking again to the disciples. And he tells them a story, right? Because they're still kind of, so apart from the seven times, he's like, no, 70 times seven, Peter. I was like, oh, Lord, I'm good with talking, but I'm not good with math. So how many, how many times again? Can you like, okay. Listen, Peter, let me tell you another story. There was this master who had a, was collecting several debts, right? It was that time of year where they needed to do their taxes. And he calls one of his servants. That servant owed the master around, let's use today's terms, $1 million in debt, right? He comes, he doesn't have it. What does the master say, right? Well, we're gonna liquidate, foreclose all your properties. We're gonna repossess your car. We're gonna put you in bankruptcy. And in those times, bankruptcy meant you, your family, your kids, I can sell them too, so that I can get as close to the million dollars that you owe me back. What does that person do? Drops down to the knees, right? Imagine it's Wells Fargo, you know? A lot of people in 2005 financial crisis, they're on the phone talking to Wells Fargo, please don't, don't take my house, don't. This guy is begging, $1 million. The master says over there at Wells Fargo, Phoenix branch division. All right, you know what? You don't deserve to be forgiven this debt. You haven't earned it, you haven't done anything, but I'm gonna let it go. Wipe it clean. This person, maybe an owner for those payday loan places, right? Goes and looks at his own sheet of collections. And the next door neighbor has an outstanding balance of a thousand dollars. And he goes to that neighbor and puts that neighbor in bankruptcy, forecloses, repossesses, does all the same things that he just came out of that phone call, that meeting, and asked for forgiveness. That person goes back to the neighbor, to the person that he knows, to the person who he's next to, and is unable to provide the same forgiveness. So furious, the master comes, takes that person back and says, because you were unable to forgive, just like you were forgiven, off you go to jail. This is why at the end, you know, those Bible verses are still there. If we are unable to forgive others, our heavenly Father will not forgive our sins. Being able to forgive requires our ability to show love to those who have hurt us, right? How can I forgive somebody that criticized my work? that didn't allow me to get that promotion? How can I love that person who cheated on me? How can I love that classmate who's bullying me? Those are very difficult things to do. We can eventually get to that point of acceptance, but forgiveness, and this is the beautiful concept of this gift that we are given. If I'm able to remember that somebody else paid a tremendous debt that I had, right? This is, this, is, this is what sin is, right? We all should 
die eternally and not have resurrection, heaven as a kingdom. There's nothing here of us we can do. But Jesus came and died for you and me. That is ultimate forgiveness. That's way beyond a million dollars, right? That's way beyond any painful thing somebody else here on earth can do, right? I'm not saying it's pleasant, all of those things that I described. It is not something that I wish anybody go through. But think about it. Those things pale in comparison to eternal damnation. That is what all of us have been saved from, eternal damnation. We have been saved and redeemed. The heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, have saved us. So when we think about forgiveness, right, it is that element of remembering what somebody else already did for us. Somebody else paid a higher price for our transgression. One of the elements that makes forgiveness difficult to achieve is that we want to seek justice. I'm only going to forgive if they beg on their knees. I'm only going to forgive if they go through a similarly painful experience. I'm only going to forgive what happened to Wells Fargo, they got fined. If they get a 2.5 million uh, file, fine, right? We equate forgiveness with justice. It's a different topic for a whole nother sermon, right? But forgiveness is not getting even. It's not fulfilling that grudge. It is actually being able to let go and love. Love somebody that's hurt you. It is very difficult to do. We're not asking you to love that action that they did. There's that big difference. Not condoning abuse, not condoning cheating, not condoning any of these things that I just said, mentioned as examples. But the person doing it. This is where we can go and say, hey, what you did? Talking behind my back, bullying me, taking my parking spot. I don't like that. Don't do it again. But I forgive you. And we need to check our emotional response the next time we remember about this. If I'm remembering about my coworker, or my classmate, my neighbor who took my parking spot, and I'm telling this to somebody else, or I'm just having that flashback, that memory, and emotionally, I start to feel anything that is not love. We need to pray. We need to remember that somebody else paid a higher price for you and me. That is the element. We can, it is very difficult, but we can remember. And once we remember that, right? A thousand dollars compared to a million. Eternal damnation compared to a parking spot. But seriously, I got angry. And then when I was telling that again, I noticed, like, it's still bothering me. But in our, the big scheme of things, right, there are different things that we go through that are not as significant as our eternal life. And this is the other messages that solidify that, if I can find my clicker. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. That's in Colossians. And then in Romans it is, but people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who were declared righteous because they earned it, because they were perfect, because they were Adventists, because they were vegetarian, without working for it. All of these elements that we do, the law, allows us to be in proximity to Christ, right? The law is a reminder. It helps us individually maintain that relationship. But that law never supersedes 
the love that we need to show God and the love that we need to show others. Our neighbors, that next person who's we may not like, we may still be angry at, we might fear. Those elements need to be replaced by love. Jesus loved us, paid the ultimate price, and that's what we need to share. And it's difficult, but like I said, forgiveness in our biblical concept is such a powerful tool. It really allows us to be able to move past some of the biggest transgressions anybody can have done against us because we understand and can experience that love that Jesus has. We can share that love to others, and we need to take a look about what we go through when we meet those individuals. So I hope that the law doesn't get in the way of us showing love to others. And I hope that if somebody's done something against you, that that transgression doesn't get in the way of you showing the love of Christ to that person. It is through that testimony that others people's like, but, but I said all those things about you. I hurt you. I bullied you. I cheated on you, right? When somebody sees our ability to overcome that, not through our own means, but through the power of Jesus, is when they get a glimpse of that salvation, that mercy. That mercy is what is going to allow them to think about that person has something different, something that I may not have, and that's a love of Jesus. That's his unwavering love, unboundful mercy, that grace. And it's not because we got even, it's not because we yelled back, it's because 70 times seven, when somebody hurts us, did a transgression, we are able to forgive. Let's bow our hats. Heavenly Father, you you love us so, so much. And we can't do anything really to deserve that love and that mercy and that gift of salvation. It's only through your grace that you give us something that we don't deserve, that we cannot earn. We've done the ultimate transgression. We sin and we crucified you on the cross. And you still forgave us. And you still love us. Some of us here may have gone through difficult situations with somebody at some point in our lives. And although we say the words, I forgive that person, in our hearts, it might be difficult for us to still show that love to them. Help us get next to you. Help us have you in proximity to our hearts so that when we meet this person, when we talk about this person, let that love fill our hearts because we remember what you did for us. And no matter what transgression happens here, there's nothing bigger than we could have done than that eternal damnation that you saved us from. We thank you, thank you, and thank you. And we pray in your name because we can earn it. In the name of Jesus, amen.